Certainly been a hot topic after thousands of Dr. Anthony Fauci's emails have been made public and many of them have brought to light new questions about the origins of the coronavirus, the effectiveness of masks among just a bevy of other topics. The emails reveal that Dr. Fauci had a very different perspective in his private conversations compared to what he said in public. Science reporter and author Alex Berenson has followed Dr. Fauci since the beginning of the pandemic. He joins us now with the breakdown of what was said and what the meaning of these emails are. Alex, good to talk with you again. Ginger, thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm curious. Uh, I mean, we've spoken to you before, but now after you've read these emails, what were your initial thoughts? So, uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's a lot in there. This is literally thousands of pages of documents. And, uh, and you know, they, they were released a couple days ago, but it takes a while to get through them. And here, here's what I would say. There's, there's, a, there, there's several interesting things, but to me, the most interesting part of this has to do with Fauci's relationship with the Wuhan lab, with his concerns about the idea that the that this might have been an artificially engineered virus, not that it was built from the ground up, but that in some way it was changed, possibly in a lab, to make it more dangerous. That research is called gain of function research. There were big debates about this in sort of 2012 through 2015. Fauci publicly supported gain of function research. And as we know, he he gave money or the NIH gave money, granted money to a group called the EcoHealth Alliance, which in turn gave some of that money to the Wuhan lab. And Fauci very clearly in January and February of 2020, as the virus, you know, as the first reports of the virus were coming out and as it looked to be very, very dangerous, was concerned about the potential that this was an engineered virus. And and what we what we don't know, what we don't know is whether or not it was an engineered virus. But one reason at this point, we have suspicions, but we don't know. But it looks like one reason we don't know that is that Anthony Fauci, along with some other very senior virologists and and infectious disease experts, really set out to discourage anybody from pursuing that theory at all. So it was considered a conspiracy theory when Senator Tom Cotton, who was a Republican, brought it up in January and February of last year. He was he was shouted down for more than a year. There were only a few people. You know, I wrote about this. Tucker Carlson talked about this. There were a few people who talked about this, but it was considered a conspiracy theory, which it was not. And it now looks like and this again, this is the most important thing that's come out so far. Fauci was privately warned about this very early. He was concerned about it. He had this mysterious conference call on February 1st, 2020 about this issue. And then people he knew went very hard to try to discourage anyone else from looking at this theory. Yeah, it was almost like because President Trump brought up that lab created theory that Dr. Fauci, even though we're seeing in his emails that he was uh, talk, he talked about it, but he went against it publicly. So I agree with you. That was my biggest takeaway. You know, the first time you appeared here on KUSI was July 8th, 2020. You urged against continuing the lockdowns and warning people that the media was overhyping the dangers. Uh, we want to play that clip for our viewers right now. Take a listen. I don't understand why the media is doing this. And I I think three months ago, it made a lot more sense. Three months ago, there was a lot more uncertainty. And certainly if you lived on the East Coast and, you know, in a place like New York, there was a lot of reason to be afraid. Right now, we know what this illness is. We know that it affects the elderly. And if you have serious health conditions, you may be at risk. We know most other people are at very, very low risk from this. We know that the lockdowns have done a lot of damage. Why don't we focus on protecting the people who need protection and try to move forward? I don't know why that is such a controversial stance to take and why the media is constantly looking for bad news. Very prophetic words. (laughs) Uh, React to that. Uh, You know, I I think that looks pretty good right now. And, (laughs) you know, I, I think the number one thing that has happened in the last 11 months is that Florida, you know, Florida in September essentially said, we're not locking down. You know, we're we're done with this. And there was a lot of talk on the left. There was a lot of, you know, Fauci was among the people who said this is a mistake. Certainly a lot of the media, you know, places like the New York Times, they criticized Governor DeSantis. And in the months since, you can't find any effect of lifting the lockdowns in a negative way. And Florida's economy has done great. A lot of people are moving there. 
So it's, you know, it's very, very hard when you look at Florida versus California or Texas versus New York, you know, sort of the red states against the blue states. You cannot find any positive impact of the lockdowns and the school closures and masks. And so I think that's led a lot of people to say, what did we do? Did we gain anything from what we've put our society through? And, you know, I know in California and on the West Coast, this still isn't over. You know, in most places, it's, you know, it's at least mostly over. But I know in California, it's not over yet. And and so I think like we really have to ask ourselves, what did we get out of this? And, you know, obviously, SARS-CoV-2, COVID, this is a real illness. People did die. But did what we did to try to stop it make any difference? And will those impacts be longer lasting? Because you also talked about not shutting down the schools. And now as the kids, at least here in California, stayed at home for 14 months, all we've heard about is the mental illness and the suicides and the educational lapses that have now been a very real impact from this disease. So do you think that's gonna be a bigger long lasting impact from this pandemic? I, I do, frankly. You know, you can you can count the number of healthy people under 50 who've died from this. I'm not going to say on one hand, but it's it's not very many people. But many, many healthy children and young adults have suffered terribly in the last 12 to 15 months. You know, overdoses are way up uh, in this country. We have an overdose crisis to begin with, and it's made, it's become much worse. Homicides are way up. We have, we have scared a lot of people who are at low risk from this. We have taken their schooling away from them for a year. It's gonna, be, it's gonna take a long time to catch up. And, let, and I know that in California and on the West Coast, the teachers unions are not making this easy. You know, they wanna continue to force children to remain masks. They're not really committing to going back five days a week next year. This is crazy. And if we had strong presidential leadership, if we had strong gubernatorial leadership, the teachers unions would be, you know, it, the, the, the rule now would be you're going back and you're not going to talk about this anymore or, or you're all going to get fired. But no one's been willing to say that to them. Uh, in my view, that is what needs to happen now. We cannot punish our children anymore from this. You know, one of the leaders in Congress said these emails show a need for more openness in the National Institutes of Health. Do you agree with that? Oh, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, I, I think we there's a lot we still don't know about Tony Fauci and what he was doing in the spring of 2020. First of all, he's got, you know, he's got phone calls. He's very careful, actually, to move a lot of stuff to the phone. That's obviously harder to get a record of. He's, he, you know, he may have texts. He may have other email accounts. We don't know yet what we don't know. But what we do know is that he was worried about gain of function and he was worried about the possibility that this came out of a lab much earlier than he admitted. And we need to find out why he seems to have discouraged any investigation into that. Remember, he's the most powerful person in the U.S. government when it comes to the coronavirus. And he very clearly had his thumb on the scale on this. And we need to know why. And, you know, it's funny. You say, you say well, it's maybe because of Trump. Uh, my, my read is a little bit different. My read is the media obviously hated Donald Trump last year and anything that Fauci said they were going to they were going to like because he was the anti Trump but why Fauci was so concerned to me might have more to do with the fact that he publicly supported gain of function research in the past and he knew how bad this could be if it came out that this virus had come out of a lab even if he didn't do anything to support the specific research the fact that he'd supported this general research made it very dangerous for him. And I think that's what we all need to remember right now. You know, I've written several of these unreported truths booklets. I've written four of them now. And I, you know, I, I'm wondering if I'm gonna have to write a fifth one about Tony Fauci and about the lab, because I do think more information is gonna come out. Yeah, so I saw you posted about that uh, just about an hour ago. So that would be part four that is the newest release. Is that correct? It, part, part four is about vaccines and what we know about vaccines. Um, you know, part, but I'm also working on a book, a whole book called Pandemia that will be out in the fall. But to me, this is such a crucial issue. Um, again, because, because we have the man who's at the very center of our pandemic response, and he seems to have had these, this hidden motivation, and we really need to explore that. Um, you know, frankly, it may be something for somebody with subpoena power to look at, because there are questions that, you know, that need to be answered that people are not going to answer unless they're under oath, I think. 
Well, I think the, the title of your, your books, Unreported Truths, is so interesting, especially when you weigh in the Anthony Fauci emails and know what he said in public. You're allowed to speak out as long as it goes along with the mainstream media, because as soon as you have a different view, you're going to be either villainized or not allowed to speak anymore. Is that what you would say? Uh, yes. I mean, I, I, unfortunately, that is what I would say. And, you know, you either need to have a really thick skin, which I guess I've developed over the last year or two, or you just need to have a really big platform. You know, if you're Tucker Carlson, you can't be canceled. So Tucker is allowed. And, you know, I don't agree necessarily with everything that he says, but he's allowed to ask questions that, you know, people, other people don't seem to be willing to ask. And, you know, if you work at The New York Times, it's very clear that, that you know, people were not going to be encouraged to follow this line of, uh, of questioning, you know, and that was true basically of all of the elite media, you know, of the Times and the Washington Post and the magazines that set the agenda. There was a clear, we're going to steer away from this and we're going to call anybody who pushes too hard on it a conspiracy theorist. Yeah, certainly goes against the premise of the Constitution and the freedoms that we are supposed to have here in America. Alex, really appreciate your time. We'll look forward to the new book as well. Ginger, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. All right, have a good night.